and now we are live on facebook good morning everybody and welcome to today's session a very happy republic day to all this is ishan sharma founder of carwan and today with me we have professor priya satya joining us from the us uh, professor priya satya specializes in modern british and british empire history especially in the middle east and south asia he is currently the raymond a sprons professor of international history at stanford university and professor satya uses the method of cultural history to study the evolution of the material infrastructure of the modern world in the age of empire state institutions military technologies and economic development her work examines the ways in which the imperial past has shaped the present and the and how the ethical dilemmas it posed were understood and managed professor satya has explored these questions in studies of british policing of the middle east Uh, in in the era of world war 1 uh, the invention of radio during the boer war the british indian development of iraq state secrecy in mass dem democratic britain and the gun making exploits of the quaker family during the industrial revolution and other projects her work on aerial policing has also informed her analysis of american drone use in the middle east professor sati also works on the partition of british india in 1947 Her first book, Spies in Arabia: The Great War and the Cultural Foundations of Britain's Covert Empire in the Middle East, published by the Oxford University Press in 2008, won the 2009 American History Association Herbert Baxter Adams Book Prize, the 2009 AHA Pacific Coast Branch Book Award, the 2010 Pacific Coast Conference on British Studies Book Prize. Her second book, Empire of the Gun: The Violent Making of the Industrial Revolution, and I highly recommend that book to everybody, uh, which was published by the Penguin Press in 2018, won the 2019 Pacific Coast Con Conference on British Studies Book Prize, the Word, the Wordsworth Prize in Business History, and the AHA's Jerry Bentley Prize in Word History. It was also a finalist of the LA Times Book Prize in History, and her recent book, Times Monster: How History Makes History. is an account of the british empire that focuses on the role of the modern historical imagination and its unfolding while also recovering alternative ethical visions embraced by anti colonial thinkers so without further ado i i welcome professor satya and thank you ma'am for being with us this morning this evening for you and for agreeing to this lecture it was it is an honor to host you this evening and i formally invite you to deliver today's carwan special lecture over to you ma'am uh, ma'am you are on mute you have to unmute yourself thank you i hope you can all hear me now um thank you ishan thank you to the carwan heritage uh group for inviting me it's my pleasure to be here and i'm so um heartened and uh, proud of uh, what you're trying to do with this organization and uh, i realized uh, just now that it's actually republic day over there in india it's still 25th here but i hope uh, the things that come up in today's lecture are relevant uh, to your thoughts today um so i will be sharing some slides uh, in a minute and um i'll try and zoom in and out of the slides uh, so we can talk uh, more closely So my talk is called the self divided the partition of 1947. Uh the partition of South Asia into Pakistan and India in 1947 we know triggered the biggest human migration in history and it was also accompanied by horrific violence. So 12 to 15 million people moved and between Uh, half to two million people were killed. Now I'm just going to show you a series of photographs and images, which may be familiar to many of you. Um, I think one of them was even used in the flyer for this uh, for the talk. So I'll just quickly show them to you, so to transport us into that that time. And I apologize, one or two are a little bit uh, hard to look at. I I won't linger on those pictures, but just so we remind ourselves, this is real. violence we're talking about bear with me as i just start the slide show okay i hope uh, everyone can see that sorry i think it made my face go dark but you can still see me i hope so first of all just 
a map to situate us. And you can see from the arrows, the directions of movement on both sides of the subcontinent. And you don't have to worry too much on the details, but just geography here. And then the familiar pictures of the trains of people walking with bullock carts by foot. And then of course, by train, refugee camps. This one is very well known, I think. This is in Delhi. Uh, just a reminder that there was arson as well. This is a village set on fire, aerial photograph. And these are the ones that I'm sorry to show you, but we have to contend with that. And again, arson burning. I'm just going to leave it on this picture, even though we haven't talked about it yet, just because it's not as hard to look at. Um, okay, so we know these images of trains full of bodies, people who have who are burned uh, in front of their families, women who are raped or kidnapped. Sometimes entire populations of villages are wiped out. Um, sometimes families kill the women of their own family or women commit suicide because they're trying to escape uh, rape or the shame of having been raped or conversion or something like that. So this violence seems chaotic, but it was actually not haphazard. It was very systemic. Um, there was wide complicity in it, and it was committed by paramilitary groups, primarily by paramilitary groups composed of former soldiers and well-trained young men who are basically like gangs with machine guns and jeeps, very efficient bodies, who took the shame, honor, and protection of their communities into their own hands, uh, often with the support of those communities. So the question for us is, for historians or people looking back, for the descendants of those people is, how did this violence on such an unprecedented scale come to pass? Did, was it a story of neighbors suddenly become enemies? Was it momentary insanity? Was it rational political intent? Was it motivated by fear, peer pressure, ideology, um, religious conviction, desperation, loot? Um, and then what was the role of the departing British rulers in all of this situation? And how have Indians, you know, Pakistanis and, and the British dealt uh, with the burden of conscience left by these events? What is, in other words, what is the psychic inheritance of the trauma of partition? Those are the questions I want to talk about in the lecture. So I want to start with the British. I'm actually a historian of Britain first, and I have this family connection to partition, and it's always been in the margins that I work, of what I work on. So I also work on that. But uh, as you'll see, I'm synthesizing the work of a lot of specialists in South Asian history as well. But let's start with the British. So most British narratives of the end of empire in India emphasize the ceremony of the transfer of power in 1947 as the fulfillment of this of the paternalistic goals of um, of British imperialism. So this is a very famous photo of the raising of the flag and a really wonderful thing happened if you can see the little boy in the middle of the photo he's turning with looking up at um, at uh, Nehru that man he lives in California and he just wrote to me out of the blue a few weeks ago saying, I am this boy in this photograph. So he's out here in California and it was an accident that he wound up in crushed uh, in the car with the, with the prime minister and Lord Mountbatten. Anyway, that's a kind of serendipitous story. But this, this is the image that the British like to hold up, a very clean image of what the end of empire was about. And from, the point of, from their point of view, the violence that went on you know, away, you know, out of their eyes, uh, out of this, out of the frame of this picture, between Indians merely proved that the steadying British hand was what had kept a lid on the native tendency to anarchy. They always said, if we leave, this place will erupt in chaos. But in fact, the violence was directly and intensely shaped by British colonialism. Certainly, even before the British were in the region, there had been conflict between different religious communities at times, but the violence of partition was something new. Religious identity had been transformed by the experience of empire 
So the violence and partition was about very modern notions of difference, not ancient hatreds between Hindus and Muslims. That is a myth. And so to understand those modern notions, we need to rewind and go back a little bit in time to see where they came from. So let's talk for a minute about 1857, the big Indian rebellion against British rule. Now the British crushed that rebellion with a lot of difficulty. It took them a whole year and they emerge from that war determined to prevent uh, Indians from ever again coming together as a block united against British rule. Um, Ishan, someone is asking to admit. Okay, so uh, let me just show you a picture. This is a, an engraving showing the, you know, some of the punishments that the British uh, gave to rebels. They, they blew thousands of them from the heads of cannons as punishment, as a terrorizing punishment. So there's a fear of, of, of colonial rebellion from this point of, you know, this kind of colonial rebellion that really shapes colonial governance after this. So we know about Orientalism and the kind of British way of understanding um, South Asian uh, religion and culture, you know, through this lens of, you know, East versus West. And that had long, that approach had long guided British efforts to codify and simplify Indian religions in a way that they could understand so that they could feel they, they knew this population that they're trying to govern. So they really saw religion as a very fixed thing. It's a fixed, mutually exclusive badge of identity. Either you are Muslim or you are Hindu. Either you are Hindu or you are Sikh. You can't be both. The same family can't be both. Uh, and in fact, we know that oftentimes religious belief and religious practice could be very fluid in different places and it could be very locally determined. Like in a certain place, these are the practices that are very different in, a, in you know, 10 kilometers away. Definitely that was the way in like my hometown in Punjab. So um, the British tied South Asian political identity to religion, to religious, linguistic, and also caste distinctions. And they built those distinctions into the uh, institutions of the colonial state with maps, and censuses, and even in public infrastructure. So this is a picture of uh, a rail station, and you can see there's a separate tea stall for Hindus. So they're building this into the actual uh, infrastructure of the country. So um, there would even be separate water taps, right, for instance. Now, these European Orientalist ideas also shaped Indian scholars who are trying to understand their own religions in the context of colonialism in this era. So I'm going to give you as an example the figure of Muhammad Iqbal, the poet who is, he's a poet and a philosopher, and he's usually credited with inspiring the movement for Pakistan. Now he went to Europe to study in 1905, and he went there in the steps of his teacher from Lahore, uh, someone, uh, this man, Thomas Walker Ar Arnold, who had taught him in government college in Lahore. And Arnold was an Orientalist and he was going to England to work for the India office, which was the office that headed the, the whole government of India. That's, you know, the Indian government in India had to answer to the Indian office in London. So Arnold is going there and Iqbal follows him. And he starts to research Islamic mysticism. This is for his PhD studies. And he's in England. He also studies in Germany and he becomes convinced that Islamic mysticism has no real foundation in original Islam, that it's alien and unhealthy and this kind of wrong turn that uh, Muslims have taken in India. And he becomes interested in the idea of real Islam, uh, kind of returning to a more pure kind of Islam as a, as, a, as a new way of thinking about organizing society. Like it doesn't have to be a nation. Why can't it be according to some other ethics or some other uh, understanding, some other social form of organization? Now, so what it, the point is that scholarly conventions around studying religion, those European ideas about Indian religion, made it very hard for anyone, even an Indian, to understand questions about Islam or Hinduism um, and, and worldly affairs outside of that framework of European Orientalism. So, and in fact, Iqbal's ideas were very much supported uh, by his very good friend in, back in Lahore, who was called Muhammad Asad. Now, Asad was a figure um, 
he was a, a European, he was Austro-Hungarian Jewish man. His original name was Leopold Weiss. And he converted to Islam and uh, wor worked with the Saudi government when it was just forming in the 1920s and 30s. And then he had a fight with uh, Saud and he came to uh, British India. And he went on to shape Pakistan's constitution and to serve uh, in the foreign ministry there. And I'm just bringing him up to highlight again, the kind of colonial intellectual, the European colonial intellectual context in which the idea of a Muslim nation state started to take shape in this period. British, Indian, British ideas of Indian religion mattered uh, in a new way, even more intensely after 1909, because uh, there's a period of this intense anti-colonial activity, especially in Bengal, with the attempt to partition Bengal in 1905. And uh, the British respond by undoing that partition. And they also say, okay, Indians can have some participation in local governance, but the participation is going to be based on religion. So there will be separate electorates for uh, Hindus and separate for Muslims. So once electorates are framed by religion, all the attendant forms of political association and communication like parties and newspapers and so on have to also be organized around religion. And that hardens the idea of religious difference. Now the British um, gained control of the Middle East in the 1920s after World War I. And that also started to shape their attitude toward Indian Muslims. They imagined a kind of telepathic unity across the, the whole Middle East and across the Northwest frontier, like everyone just magically knows it's connected to each other. Um, and they worry that if they make a mistake, a political mistake with Muslims in India, then that's going to have negative effects for their rule uh, over Muslims in the Middle East as well. So this is a very kind of paranoid, Islamophobic way of thinking, but it's very essential to understanding um, British support for the idea of Pakistan as well. And perhaps most importantly, by, by the time you get to you know, the 1920s or 1930s, partition is already part of Britain's decolonization toolkit. It's a tactic, it's a technology almost that they use. They've already used it in Ireland. They're proposing to use it in Palestine. And the same officials you know, are applying it in these different contexts and carrying the idea with them and saying, well, this, we tried this there, let's try it here as well. So just to give you a sense of uh, what those other partitions looked like. So in short, there's, there's the colonial ordering of societies by fixing religious identities, then the colonial division of land based on those identities and trying to make this you know, complete mix of people uh, more rational in some way, more orderly, more governable from their point of view. So the British priority when decolonization was happening was that whatever new entity would emerge, their priority was only that that entity, whether it's one entity or two entities or three, it should just remain in the Commonwealth, in the British Commonwealth, because that would give Britons the feeling of some continuity, that it's not a total absolute break with the British. There's still hope for some informal, at least, influence over what goes on in South Asia. So partition is totally compatible with that vision from their point of view. And in fact, both India and Pakistan were initially both dominion states of the Commonwealth. So looking at this whole picture, the history of empire in South Asia, Britain clearly bears, bears significant responsibility for the fact that partition happened. But what about the violence? that accompanied partition, which, you know, that you can have partition without violence as well, in theory, right? Um, and here I'm going to lean on the work of Yasmin Khan, that I, which I recommend to all of you as well, on the subject of partition. So first we have to remember the context. So again, apologies for the, the photograph. There's a famine in Bengal in 1943 that's caused by uh, British wartime grain distribution policies, and it kills more people than partition itself, and it dramatically compromises Bengal's ability to cope with partition. It's already gone through this very painful, destructive event. I'm just going to change the photo. Um, British cultural beliefs also made them adopt a very passive, almost fatalistic approach to violence between Hindus and Muslims. Uh, for instance, in Benares in 1946, the British district magistrate basically just assumed that the city was about to be 
quote, burnt down, and that Hindus and Muslims are going to fly at each other's throats. And with that kind of outlook, he, he, he prioritized planning his departure to go back to England rather than trying to take measures to prevent violence. And from his point of view, it was just fated to happen and there was nothing he could do about it. So that kind of fatalistic thinking really underwrote hasty withdrawal of resources and manpower and ensured that the British conscience nevertheless remained very easy. Once British aims were secure, officials in London paid very little attention to Indian daily life they focused only on the safety of British civilians in India. And at every turn, they speed up events, stunning the Indian public with announcements about the accelerated calendar, which made partition more and more unavoidable. And if you think about the way Brexit has unfolded, you can see an echo of just that sort of frantic pace and trying to get things done and, and, and the kind of stress that creates. And, and, and Brexit was a much more you know, relatively simple compared to this as a partition story. In the summer of 1947, the British army also starts to depart from South Asia just when India's own army is being divided and is not available to control any violence that erupts. In Punjab, while the trouble is unfolding, the British command actually confine their troops to the barracks and evacuate them as quickly as possible. And they're given confidential instructions that uh, British army units have no operational functions or responsibilities except in an emergency to save British lives. So they're hastily dismantling the state and that made it harder to address the violence, but it also made the, a lot of that violence possible in the first place. So the British administration is withdrawing control at the provincial level, just as Indian leaders are you know, eagerly seizing that control right after provincial elections happen in 1946. So the imperial state starts to let go of its law and order capacity and its sense of responsibility and offers very little support to admit local administrators who are trying to deal with routine local politics. And the British aim in all of this is to kind of cut their losses and avoid investing any more in India's infrastructure. So they're running down intelligence units so that means that local officials have less and less information, less ways to predict uh, where violence is about to erupt. The government stops counting people. They stop collecting data right when information of that kind is, is really urgently needed. So in a way, what you can say is that people in the subcontinent made their own history, but as Karl Marx would say, not in circumstances of their own choosing. Colonial sociology shaped their outlook, their sense of their religious identity, and imperial indifference uh, created a climate of insecurity that could own, that just had to give rise to uh, violence. British conscience remained easy thanks to their notions of permanent Muslim and Hindu difference, which had long justified the British presence in South Asia in the first place and had paved the path to partition. Okay, so that's the British angle. What about Indians? What about the whole emphasis on nonviolence in the Indian independence movement? How did the same people leave so many bodies unburied and uncremated, which is perhaps, you know, the most obvious sign of a total civilization breakdown? Again, the context of World War II and the, that transfer of power, of the dismantling of the imperial state um, without something being quite ready to replace it right away, that context mattered. So during World War II, a lot of the Congress party, you know, was jailed because they're launching the Quit India movement. And that enabled rival parties like the Muslim League and the right-wing party, the Hindu Mahasabha, to flourish. And after the war, um, when the Congress party leaders emerge, their commitment to nonviolence is a little bit diluted because they have to try and latch on to movements that have become popular in the meantime, especially, for instance, the cause of the Indian National Army, um, which had become famous for fighting the British alongside the Japanese Army. And this is just a picture of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. He's on the edge of the picture, standing um, with the uh, Japanese uh, Army leadership in 1943 in Tokyo. So the war itself gave many Indians very violent experiences. You have soldiers, millions of them coming back from the war. There, many of them are disgruntled, disillusioned, 
Uh, they start joining new defense groups and volunteer kind of these paramilitary organizations that are forming across the North, especially. And they still often have their guns with them from, from wartime. And they also have bombs that have been left over from the war. And these, these groups that they're joining um, also share an imprint of Western fascism. Sometimes they even acknowledge the example of Hitler and the Nazis. These groups would be holding rallies in uniforms with flags. They would attract students and youth and opportunist criminals in addition to these ex-soldiers. Some of them became very large, very well organized, very professionalized, more like private militias. Uh, the RSS is one example of this. It's a Hindu paramilitary a volunteer organization, and we know the power of that today. The Muslim League National Guards is sort of their counterpart pictured here. Now, from the British perspective, these armed groups don't pose a direct challenge to British interests, so they don't worry about them very much. Now, some provincial politicians uh, who are stepping into power after 1946, they start to use these groups for policing as they're shifting from being the opposition against the British to being the government in power. And they're very eager to show their power on the eve of independence. And now that wartime British repression of nationalist activity is over, Indian politicians can roam more freely, kind of say what they want, they can spread propaganda, um, and police and other officials who had earlier maybe feared showing their nationalist support can now openly uh, uh, you know, express very partisan views, express favor for particular political leaders. Uh, and they sort of lose their image of neutrality as a result. So day-to-day -day life uh, starts to be shaped by committees that are um, divided along uh, league and Congress lines. And, and the words of politicians became very close to incitement. So there's this kind of breakdown of law and order, and it starts to produce paranoia and fear in everyday life. And in this atmosphere, all forms of identity become subordinated to faith in a single political identity. You are with us or you're against us, zero or one, right? You can't be in any gray area in that situation. So this is the tense backdrop against which all the political parties, or at least enough of the political parties, agree to the partition plan in June 1947. And they don't, they have no idea what, what that's, what's going to happen. They don't know it's going to result in these millions of deaths. They don't even know that 15 million people are going to move. That is not planned at all. Um, and besides not anticipating what's going to happen, they don't offer any assurance that citizenship or property or life is going to be guaranteed in all places. And without that kind of assurance, without also information for two more months about where the new border is going to fall, you can imagine people were terrified. They had no idea what was going to befall them. And they're under extreme mental stress their nerves are on edge, they're living under curfew, they're always hearing sirens, they hear militias in the street, and people are making decisions in that kind of atmosphere. Um, and, and the decisions from the government about, you know, which infrastructure is going to which side, which land is going to which side, um, what, does it, what is the separation going to mean? Is it going to be an absolute border with no, uh, trans, you know, no way to cross it? Or is it going to be pretty fluid? Um, are people going to be asked to move? What will happen to major cities like Calcutta and Lahore? None of that is clearly openly decided. Uh, it's all hasty and confused. And that's a very difficult environment in which to make a decision about your personal life. So people start to move. They start to move because they're scared. Some of them move because they really believe in the new idea of Pakistan, for instance. Some move by accident. They happen to be on the other side of the border when the border falls and then they have to stay there. And many, many, many were driven out or systematically hounded out. Uh, and bureaucracies uh, themselves became very dysfunctional as the officers in these bureaucracies, they have to make their own personal decisions about whether to move their families and themselves, or they have to try and please their new political masters, or they're just suffering from crippling anxiety themselves. Um, and many of them just don't show up at their posts or they're openly partisan and unapproachable. Now news of the fact that the army is gonna be divided is a further blow. Without army or civil services functioning, a job especially is 
held hostage by these militias. So every community in every place is worried about becoming a persecuted minority. And so all the ingredients for ethnic cleansing are in place. You have a feeble, polarized police force, you have no troops, and you have a well-armed and very scared population. So then you can see with all this context that the violence, you can't say the violence of partition was caused by religion, right? The exclusionary politics of this time, the scale of killing and the grouping along religious lines, these are all new. So the, the violence really marked the crumbling of an old colonial order and the total abdication of responsibility for minorities by anyone who had any kind of power. Okay, so that's good. That's the sort of narrative of how, how partition happens and how, why it's so violent. Now I wanna think a little bit about, and we talked about British conscience. Now let's talk a little bit about conscience in India among Indians and Pakistanis. So as I said, the killing is genocidal in some places, but I'm sure you've all heard of the stories of heroism and kindness and generosity, people saving each other, people wanting to go home, sometimes actually going home or going back and forth. Um, there's a lot of stories of help and protection that strangers offer each other, that neighbors offer each other. Um, and so that suggests that even though religious identity is mattering in a new way, in a desperate way, there are other kinds of com moral community continue to exist, varying probably by, from place to place and moment to moment. So you have violence temporarily forging a sense of a national community, Indians or Pakistanis. But there are still other allegiances that can at times override that. Allegiances to class or caste or language, village, and so on. And that complicated the task of turning uh, Indians into Indians and Pakistanis. So colonial social engineering is layering this binary zero and one sense of religious identity on top of people who are very complicated, actually. They're not just defined by that category, Hindu and Muslim. So, in, and if you look back, the nationalist struggle itself had been marked by many efforts to try and go beyond nationhood, right? Beyond thinking of just Indian or just Pakistani. Um, Iqbal, as I said, was thinking of trying to, I mean, he's thinking in the time of World War I when you see what nation states do to each other and how destructive the nation state system is. So he's trying to think outside the box and say, we need a better idea, right? Gandhi, when he talks about village republics, he's doing the same thing. He's trying to say, nation state is not a good concept. Tagore also, he says, we don't want a world divided into fragments, right? They're all trying to get away from the nation state idea. Um, and they're trying to create and imagine other kinds of community. So leftists uh, also come up with different ideas. Um, they're seeing India's struggle as part of a wider global revolutionary struggle. And we know that the Russian Revolution happened in 1917, and that gave them some inspiration to imagine a world that could be both post-colonial, but also post-national, because the Soviet Union is a federation, right? It's not a nationally defined um, polity. And uh, we know that there was also a moment, uh, this movement in the early 20s called the Khilafat movement, in which the Muslim League, you can see the flag of the Muslim League, and the Congress party, you can see their flag up there as well, are joined together in a single struggle and working together. I mean, in the 1940s, we think of these as totally incompatible political parties, but here they are involved in a meaningful joint struggle. And they're talking about the caliphate. This is again about something that's beyond the nation. If you think about a figure like Hasrat Mohani, right? He was the leader of the Muslim League, um, but he also wrote devotional poems to Lord Krishna. He helped found the Indian Communist Party. So what should we call him? Should we call him a Muslim, a communist, a Hindu, a nationalist? Uh, what nation, if he's a nationalist? Is he an internationalist? Um, you can think of uh, Muhammad Ali Johar, uh, another poet figure also, who was the leader of Congress in 1923. And he talked about, you know, his goal was to something post-nationalist. He said, let's create a federation, quote, grander, nobler, and, and infinitely more spiritual than the United States of America. So he was thinking United States of India. 
Then there's the Bhagat Singh's organization, the Hindustan Republican Association, the HRA. And they use violent tactics in this period and their goal is also a United States of India. So there are a lot of ideas around in the 1920s, especially. And this kind of revolutionary activity is what fuels British fears. They're so worried about Indians actually wanting more than a nation. And they're worried about Islamic and Bolshevik kind of conspiracy. And so they start using all kinds of really violent policing techniques in the region, especially in the Middle East and on the Northwest frontier. And even in Punjab, they use aerial uh, bombardment. But that's what the British see, take from it. But what we can see from all these different ideas is that Indian people in this period were managing very complex and contradictory identities in creative ways. If you think of someone like Hazrat Mohani or, or Johar, right? So some people were actually members of the Hindustan Republic Association, which is a, all about using violent tactics if you need to, and at the same time, members of the Congress Party, which says only use nonviolence. And they didn't think of that as a huge, like a hypocrisy or a huge contradiction. You could be both. Um, so some people were pro-revolutionary violence and pro-Gandhi and nonviolence at the same time. So they're managing contradictions and that could sometimes produce ironic outcomes. If you think about it during World War II, you have the Hindu Mahasabha and the Muslim League, two groups who say Hindus and Muslims are incompatible. They are different, they need different nations and they are forming successful coalition governments in three different provinces, right? So they're incompatible, but they're completely compatible at the same time. So what's going on here? There's a kind of resignation to cognitive dissonance, right? So I wanna talk a little bit about that cognitive dissonance, the divided self and that as a, the cultural ideal of a divided self. So um, that ideal is very culturally deep especially in the North, I'm gonna say. Um, and it's part of religiously syncretic mystical notions of birha, which is the longing for union with the divine. And if anyone here follows Urdu poetry, uh, I think it's become very popular again now uh, with Rekta and everything. The, the subject of the, that poetry, that tradition of poetry is split. So just to give, oh, excuse me, I should have shown you this quote from Johar earlier. Um, just to give quick examples that may already be familiar to you to show you what I mean by a split subject, right? And for those who don't uh, speak uh, Hindustani, it's, it's given in English below. Momin, 19th century. Okay, so this culture, why am I bringing this up? This cultural outlook had long shaped responses to colonialism. If we remember, Poets of the Mughal court nurtured a cult around a lost homeland as the Mughal stars eclipsed, right, in the 19th century. And the last uh, Mughal emperor was Bahadur Shah Zafar, who was himself a poet. And you can see him commenting, right, on the disaster after 1857. <laughs> Right? And you can even interpret this famous uh, chair of his I don't know if it's a comment on censorship after uh, the crushing of the rebellion. I don't know, you can read it that way. Uh, it's, it's worth wondering about. So what I'm saying is that Urdu poetry, we take it as this sort of literary form, but it was always evolving in the 19th century and the 20th century in the context of this worldly problem of colonialism and the crisis of culture and identity that colonialism produced. So the concept of birha at the heart of this tradition really fused worldly and unworldly concerns. So Punjab, as we know, becomes a primary site for recruitment into the British Indian Army in the 19th century, early 20th century. And many Punjabis actually escape that and the poverty of the region uh, and go to North America uh, where I am. And uh, there they start writing, here's just a picture of some Punjabis in California in 1910. They start uh, writing poetry um, in which the same motif of uh, Birha is all about expressing longing uh, for the lost homeland, right? For the days that the Pardesi had left behind. So this is the magazine Gadar di Gunj. You can read it in either of these scripts. 
uh, it says Bande Matram, Gadar Di Gunj, and some stories about Lala Hardyal and Unki Giriftari. And uh, it's just full of poetry uh, in that same mode. Um, if you think about it, so many of India's nationalist leaders studied and lived abroad. Um, you know, you can think of, I just mentioned it, Iqbal, you can think of Tagore, you can think of Gandhi, Nehru, so many of them, that the Pardesi sentiment is common in their all of their patriotism. When Bhagat Singh, oh, excuse me, this is Tagore in Vancouver in 1929 with some Punjabi people, migrants. This is Bhagat Singh. Um, when he and his companions launched a hunger strike in prison in 1929, 5,000 people gathered in a park in Amritsar to recite poems comparing their love of country to the love of Hir Ranja, which is again, a kissa based on the same theme of, of, of Birha. So the, what I'm saying is this Birha idiom, it's not just a mystical or just a literary idiom, it's political in this period. So the Northern poetic idiom has evolved in the period of colonialism to express loss and exile. And when partition happens, it really enhances the resonance of that idiom. So this poet, Amrita Pritam, she leaves Lahore during partition and she writes this, her, you know, about her anguish of what's, about what's going on in a very famous poem, Aj Akha Vareshanu. And who is Varesha? He's the, you know, the 18th century author of the most famous version of the Hiranja story, right? Aj Akha Vareshanu kito kabra micho bol, te aj kitabe ishkda koi agla varka kol. I hope you guys can follow the translation if it's not clear. So why did Amrita Pritam have such a sense of Varisha's power? What does Varisha have to do with this, right? And why does she think her own voice as a poet is so important? That's because she's part of a political literary movement called the Progressive Writers Movement, which has begun in the 1930s. And this movement is all about asserting the importance of poets and poetry to liberatory politics. It's part of a global trend. Um, it's part of a global trend in this period of, it's a polarizing period all over the world, right? Between fascism and socialism and writers all over the world are, are being politicized in a new way. And some of these people in progressives are also tracing their roots to the poet leaders of the 1857 rebellion. And what the progressives want is different from what Congress wants, right? They want freedom in a much broader sense, um, not just freedom from the British, but a total social, economic, and political transformation of India. So Hasrat Mohani, for instance, was a member of this. And he stayed in India uh, in 1947. He actually helped to draft the constitution, but he became so skeptical of the process that he never signed it. And then he died in Lucknow in 1951. And I think we can ask, would he have stayed or would he have left? Um, a lot of progressives hoped that partition was just a temporary event and a longer struggle that was headed to much more radical ends. So Sahir Ludhyanvi, uh, for instance, originally from Ludhiana, right? But he's in Lahore when partition happens and he stays there, but he's a communist and he's persecuted for that by the new Pakistani government. So he goes back to Bombay in 1949 and he starts writing lyrics for movies that are love stories, but also, um, you know, they're about eternal division, but they're also about eternal liberatory aspiration. If you think of a movie like Piazza or you think of a movie like Pir Subahogi, though that's the same theme. So the very movements of some of these poets dramatize the agon and agony, the cognitive dissonance that's at work as people are coping with partition. So the writer Sadat Hassan Manto is perhaps most famous for this. He leaves Bombay for Pakistan, and then he dramatizes the absurdity of the choice in his famous story, Toba Tek Singh, which ends with this deranged central character refusing to choose between the two countries which are depicted as lunatic asylums behind barbed wire borders. And this guy, Bishan Singh, he dies in the no man's land between them. And Manto himself was like, you know, in, agonized over his choice and struggled with depression and um, finally died uh, due to alcoholism in the 1950s. Josh Malihabadi is the one with the, how should I say, the smaller mustache <laughs> in the middle of the photo. Um, here he is with uh, Nehru. He was a very close friend of Nehru. He was the chief editor of the Indian government's Urdu newspaper, Ajkal. Uh, 
And he just could not decide what to do. And he would go back and forth between India and Pakistan and finally stayed in Pakistan in 1958, but he still kept pining to go back. Some people had a lot of conviction and went to Pakistan because they believed it. And some kept their conviction and some lost it and became more ambivalent. Some nurtured a sense of transcendental connection across the border. So the border is there, but it doesn't matter. So Gandhi, for instance, said, quote, I do not consider Pakistan and India as two different countries. If I have to go to the Punjab, I'm not going to ask for a passport. I shall go walking and nobody can stop me. And he was not alone in insisting on the continued connection, uh, on continued connection that might render this new border meaningless. Of course, this is partly denial, right? It's a coping mechanism because they're dealing with the trauma of partition, but it's also genuinely hopeful because it really wasn't clear how history was going in 1947, 1948, 1949. You have to remember there's a massive rebellion right in the middle of the subcontinent, uh, the Telangana rebellion. And when the you know, Indian army finally crushes the, that late in 1948, the next year you have a major revolution in China. It's really not clear that what's happened in 1947 is the settled end of the Indian liberatory struggle, right? So you have to kind of imagine how they felt in that moment. So they have this kind of wounded optimism and that creates a space for a post-partition self that can both encompass and transcend this new division and even perhaps the violence that came with the new division. And here I'm leaning on the work of Amir Mufti. So uh, he gives the example of Fez Ahmed Fez, who's another Pakistani poet of this period. And he, in a lot of his poetry, expresses the condition of a self not at home with him itself, but aware that this feeling of incompleteness is what gives it life and movement and motivation. So here are just two lines from one poem in 1971. So separation and union are collapsed into one, distance and nearness coexist. Self and other do not become one, but they're simultaneously near and distant, kind of uncertain. The poet Jagannath Azad uh, left Lahore and came to Delhi in 1947. And then he went back to visit Pakistan afterwards and he wrote, so it's still his home. He's alienated, but he's still not a guest. He's guest-like. So he's split into host and guest, both at home and not at home, DC and Pardesi. So post-partition Urdu poetry, you can also see, continue to invoke places across the border as if there was no border. Like they'll mention Sialkot or they'll mention Delhi as if there's no border. Um, and Pakistani poets would continue to rely on the non-Islamic symbolism of things like puja, chitta, but, uh, things like that, on which the ironic idiom of Urdu poetry depends. And this, this poetic tradition really presumes a world and depends on a world of Muslims coexisting with non-Muslims. You can think of it as the world of Medina, uh, in order to dramatize the ironies of worldly and unworldly faith at its core. It depends on a split social body. So partition was supposed to fulfill the religious narrative of virtuously abandoning a heathen land, what's called hijrat. But in this poetry, the abandoned home is instead a beloved, not a heathen place. Now, the idea of transcending borders was a kind of reworking of that idea of birha. This poetic idiom was always all about transcending worldly reality for something more meaningful. And it remains so popular today because it really resonates with the experience of millions of people. And I think you can probably, I focused on Urdu here and in some ways culturally it was dominant in dealing with um, some of these things, but you can tell intersecting stories about Bengali, Hindi, Punjabi, and so on. And, and I wanna emphasize this is not a specialized highbrow intellectual history, but part of the cultural mainstream. You can see the same themes of division, split personality, doubling of identity in films, in plays, in art, and so on. I'm sure you're all familiar with all of these iconic works. Um, so, uh, so what we're seeing here is that living contradiction becomes a way of superseding loss. After 1947, the Indian and Pakistani governments had to work really hard and engage in what uh, the historian Vazira Zamindar calls a long partition of land and people to really 
create uh, Indians and Pakistanis clearly, you know, over time. And for, for most of those people, they were in, experiencing a condition of self that could both encompass and transcend division. And oral histories of partition survivors really confirm this widespread prevalence of this feeling of split selfhood. Even those who moved out of conviction because they believed in the idea of Pakistan continued to feel a bond with the home that they had abandoned. There's not a clear line for these people, writes the oral historian Anam Zakaria. It is difficult to decipher where they belong more. This confusion is the only truth for them. So partition did not so much create coherent national selves as populations of divided selves. You can think of the exile, the refugee, the orphan, the converted, the abducted and reclaimed. All of these kinds of survivors are split in some way. This sensibility forged through the colonial experience produced a particularly South Asian way of being modern. And it still exists even in the Modi era. All this helps us to understand the survival of other kinds of moral community in the region despite partition. But when it came to acknowledging guilt for complicity in the violence or in partition, liberal narratives of progress inherited from colonial rule remained robust. The idea that partition was the price of national progress, for instance. So a sense of displacement is very central to say Punjabi identity in a very different way from it is from the way it is in for Jewish or Armenian uh, identity, because the Punjabi is aware of his own role in his tragic severance from his home and violent division of his homeland. And I do mean his here. His is a self-imposed exile guiltily justified by one or another promise of modernity, personal prosperity for economic migrants, national prosperity for partition refugees. He self-consciously martyrs the homeland for the progress of its children, secure that in dutifully pursuing his worldly ends, he nevertheless maintains a timeless bond with it. And continued turmoil in the region from the 1960s continued to sharpen that trend. It's fascinating to think about how this history might be mattering in the present as Punjabi farmers lead the largest ever protest against the Modi government. Across religious traditions, to conclude, we know that conscience is understood as a kind of splitting of the self into observer and observed, right? The, you have an inner eye or an inner voice. Liberalism, which is the ideology of the British Empire, asked its followers to paper over the split, to reassure that, that skeptical inner voice that what seems morally dubious in the present will will bear vindicatory, uh, redemptive fruit in the future, right? You have to sacrifice the present for the future. And that enabled that easy British imperial conscience and also an easy Indian mainstream nationalist conscience when it came to partition. But the thinkers that I focused on in my lecture questioned that liberal narrative in different ways. Progressive urged progressives, many of these poets, urged the limitless horizon of human aspiration and creativity and the centrality of connection to it. Gandhi emphasized the value of absorption in craft as a means of dissolving consciousness, a cure, this was for him a kind of cure for the unsound ethical uh, bearings and sort of endless material craving of liberalism, which asks us to sacrifice the present for some goal of future progress. Gandhi and craft is all about curing that habit of being absent from the present and recovering a way of being in which conscience and consciousness are one. Nationalism and colonialism have historically been forces of violent displacement, disrupting social and cultural relations by unleashing dynamics of inclusion and exclusion. Those who participated in them became houses divided unto themselves, struggling to encompass their complicity in these destructive dynamics. It's interesting to remember that partition's violence has not been memorialized, unlike, say, the Holocaust or Hiroshima, contemporary, you know, massive human disasters. And I think that's partly because of widespread bad conscience resulting from the fact of widespread complicity in that violence. The imminent passing of that generation of partition survivors has unleashed a scramble to collect testimony 
and memorialize the event before it's too late. This is the work of the partition archive, uh, which I work with. And if this job, if this work is undertaken with sufficient sensitivity, it may enable a new reckoning with conscience and allow us to fully understand how Indians and Pakistanis dealt with the burden of conscience after partition, as they continue to cope with the unfinished business of partition, you know, the, the incorporation of minorities, the problem of Kashmir, communal violence, the relation of religion to the state, and so on. And going forward, we might try to recover the alternative ethical frameworks of those who sought to transcend partition, those who instead committed to ideas of connectedness or love or a wider conception of azadi and freedom and of self-rule. Um, so thank you so much for listening to the lecture. I'm going to stop the share, but I can, we can revisit any pictures if that comes up in, in your questions and comments. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, delivering the lecture. It was so amazing and engrossing that we all enjoyed it. And especially the part where you introduce some of the poets like Amrita Sher, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, the Amrita Pritam and Sahil Udhyanvi. So that was one of the most interesting parts that I found, and especially the references to the, the movies like Ram or Sham and Vag that you mentioned. So we have one question as of now, and if we have any other questions or if people want to ask any question later on, they can mail us at carvanheritage at gmail.com. We'll share the questions to Professor Satya and then she can also reply to the through emails. Uh, this question is from Arnab Mondal and he wants to ask about the historiography and the books that are there on, on this topic that you referred to in, in the in the lecture and that you sure. um, yeah. So the, the three books that I mentioned, one I mentioned Yasmin Khan, right? I think the title is The The Great Divide or the Great Partition. I'm forgetting. I should know, but um, it's a wonderful book and really gives you a sense of the context. And it, we would have done the same thing if we were there, right? Um, what happened was just a very human response to a breakdown of society and social relations. Um, the other book I mentioned was Amir Mufti. His book is Enlightenment and the Colony. Uh, I think I also mentioned Vazira Zamindar's book, The Long Partition. Um, and then uh, some of this material, especially on poets, is in my own book, which is called Time's Monster. There's a whole chapter on partition focused very much on these poets, if you're interested in that. Yeah. Uh, one question that I would like to ask you is that we always talk about the political divide and, and, and the, you know, the, the division of memories and all the experience is that people had. But one of the effects of decolonization was also the decolonization of the mind that hmm. is not complete as of yet. So what's your take on the decolonization of mind in India? Yeah, I think that was Gandhiji's main uh, argument. I mean, his main goal, you could even say, is that we need to decolonize the mind. And that's why Western education is the first thing that should go, right? And it's, point of view. And what he meant was really this, this problem of um, liberalism and liberal thinking. And I think uh, we have the same problem in, in the United States as well, like this idea that you, you cannot be, liberalism does not allow you to be an ethical person in the way that someone like Gandhi wants everyone to be. And that even someone like Iqbal would say that is the purpose of human life is your personal evolution as an ethical being. But if you believe in liberalism, you're always sacrificing the present for the future. You're always saying, I, I won't be ethical now because later, because I can't afford to, because progress is hanging on it, right? And so decisions are always made that way with an eye to progress in the future. Some history is gonna judge in the future. In the future, something will come. And so all the minutes up to that, you are, are making unethical decisions. So that's why, I mean, so that's the decolonizing the mind. And when he's talking about self-rule, he's really talking at that individual level that uh, that kind of personal uh, freedom of thought and freedom of uh, choice in your actions. Yes. So thank you so much, ma'am, for taking out time to deliver this lecture. It's already quite late in America and you took out time to deliver this lecture. It was an honor to host you. <laughs>
and i think this lecture thank you for inviting me thank you so much ma'am and i think this lecture is going to be very helpful for many students and they can connect with you through email i think so thank you so much and thank you so much everybody who joined us live uh, on facebook yeah, thank the you all. sorry i can't see you i hope the sound was okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was great ma'am and the the video will be available on youtube by today's evening so do check it out do like and subscribe do share if possible thank you so much and have a great day